Hello, my name is Bill Mayosmith, and I'm the Vice Chair of Education at uh, Brigham and Women Radiology Department. And I want to thank you for visiting us uh, virtually uh, in this era of COVID-19. And what I'd like to do in this brief presentation is give you an overview of our department. Uh, we have 120 radiology faculty in our department, 39 PhDs with extensive funding, $76 million of funding, 161 research uh, funds with 18 research fellows. We train 65 Harvard Med students and the medical student education is required at the medical schools, so our trainees are actively involved with medical student education. We have 41 residents and 65 clinical fellows in 11 subspecialty divisions. This is a busy slide, but I show it just to give you an overview on the number of people who are involved in education in Brigham and Women's Radiology Department. We have our directors of the three different residencies, the IRDR, DR, and the nuclear medicine. We have division chiefs, and then we have resident education liaisons. These are people in each division who are devoted to your education, medical student education liaisons, and then a large number of support people. So we have 80 faculty in positions for education in our department. As we look at models for radiology education, uh, we have PGY-1 through PGY-6. And PGY-1, as you all know, is the internship. And then PGY-2, 3, and 4 are somewhat standardized, after which comes the core exam. And in most programs, there's the fourth year of radiology residency. And most residents then go on to a clinical fellowship. One of the opportunities we have by being such a large program is the ability to have the first three years as all other training programs do. But the potential, if you want to, to combine your fourth year of your residency with your fellowship to blend these a little bit more for research or further educational opportunities. And for those who are interested in scientific uh, investigation, we have the clinical science pathway. And that's a unique program that you can apply for in which you get research time during your third year and then do research in your fourth year and during your fellowship year PGY-6 as well. So if we do this, what are the synergies of your fellowship year at Brigham and Women's Hospital? We have abdomen and intervention division, angio-interventional, breast, cardiovascular, ED. You can do electives as our residents have done at Mass Eye and Ear. You can do them in informatics, musculoskeletal, neuroradiology, or oncology at Dana-Farber, nuclear medicine, pediatrics at Boston Children's, and research project of your choosing, thoracic or ultrasound. In addition, we develop different uh, tracks within your education. So clinician scientist track, clinician educator track, global health track, quality informatics track, the data science track, leadership administrative tract, and then if you develop, if you have an idea that you want to do something that's interesting, what do you want to accomplish track, I call it, this is something you can apply for and we can make creative uh, areas of investigation and education for you. So that's nice theoretically, but how has this worked? Uh, we have a lot of experience now in the past five years, and this is a, a listing of our residents who are in the clinician scientist pathway. And a number of these have now joined our faculty uh, over the course of time, or have joined the faculty of our sister institution, Mass General Hospital. We have the education pathway, uh, which was pioneered by Shauna Madelon. We'll be speaking about this later on in the presentation. The global health pathway, the data science center pathway for machine learning and artificial intelligence, the quality informatics pathway, we have an opportunity to get dual boarded in nuclear medicine and radiology residency in a four-year program, and we have two residents uh, uh, who have been working in this pathway. We uh, have a leadership and administration pathway with three different trainees who have been involved with this, and most recently Ariadne D. Simone, who's our current chief resident. And then what I like to say is what sounds cool to do pathway. Again, as I said, if you have an interesting idea of something you'd like to be involved with, we're very open and receptive to new ideas. Of course, our most valuable asset within a, any residency is the residents themselves. And this is a listing of our current residents at Brigham and Women's 
radiology department and we're so proud of them and all that they have accomplished and look forward to having you come and join us in our program as well. This is a Google map of uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital and I did not train here and one of the things that struck me when I came six years ago was the powerful neighbors that are in our neighborhood. And we have the original Peter Bent Brigham Hospital, Brigham and Women's. There's a cardiovascular building. There's a Hale Neuroscience building. We are physically attached to Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. We are physically attached to Boston Children's Hospital. We are attached to Harvard Medical School with the Count Way Library and the Harvard School of Public Health. So this is really a unique physical environment in which to train because we have incredible resources of Harvard Med School, Boston Children's Hospital, and Dana-Farber Cancer Center, which are really world leaders in their respective fields. So these are, uh, this is a quick overview on my part of what we have at the Brigham. And what we'll be following now are some brief examples from various trainees and faculty of what makes Brigham education unique. And so you'll be hearing from our uh, residents and faculty about the clinician scientist research pathway, the data science pathway, the quality informatics pathway, the global health pathway, medical education, leadership. And so uh, we really appreciate you taking the time to come and interview with us. We think our program is one of the most exciting and top in the country and even world. And we hope that you will be able to join us in our future ahead. Thank you very much. Hello and welcome to the Brigham Radiology Department. We are so excited to have you interested in anxious to learn more about our radiology residency program. My name is Claire Tempany, the Vice Chair of Research for the Department of Radiology at the Brigham. And with the next few minutes, we'll give you an overview on what we in the radiology department do in line of radiology research at the Brigham Women's Hospital. A big overview, a big picture. We have, of course, a diverse portfolio of researchers working both as MDs and PhDs. Uh, both all, all as principal investigators. We have over 50 NIH grants, 40 foundation grants, and 30 industry awards. We're very proud to say that in FY19, the last year of data available right now, the Brigham ranked nationally at number eight, eight in the rankings for NIH funding across the US. I want to share with you five exemplary programs that we um, are very proud of at the Brigham and are somewhat different than you'll see in other programs that you may be interviewing in. Uh, image guided therapy, molecular imaging, and MR neuroimaging um, are going to be presented briefly today. Image guided interventions is one of the hallmark programs of our department, <coughs> excuse me, with um, the premier program being called the National Center for Image Guided Therapy or the NCIGT. This is a major award from the NIH, which I'm proud to say I'm the principal investigator in now in its 16th year and fingers crossed will be renewed next year. We work in a space called AMIGO, which stands for Advanced Multimodal Image Guided Operating Room, where we have a combination of an MRI scanner over here on the right of your image and in the middle an operating room and on the left a PET CT scanner. The MRI scanner is mounted on rails, which you may be able to see with my arrow here, which can might move the magnet into the middle room for imaging, for example, during neurosurgery cases where brain tumor resection is so challenging without imaging. We use this in a multiple, multiple programs uh, throughout the department. We also have been Honored to work with the surgical planning lab developed by Ron Kikinis and Frank Ulez many years ago, which really developed the concept of how to image in 3D in the operating room, how to display data, <coughs> a new augmented reality visualization. For example, this young woman wearing a HoloLens here is able to see a holographic image of the temporal bone as displayed on these images. These are the kind of really very cool tools that we're bringing to bear to the operating room and to all, pay, all doctors who do procedures, interventional radiologists, radiation oncologists, breast surgeons, brain surgeons, and others who all depend on imaging during their procedures. Our nuclear medicine program is second to none in the country with many pieces of equipment that enrich this program with radiochemistry on site, cyclotron on site, and uh, 
a um, farm radio pharmacy support system that allows us to develop our own FDG glucose, which is one of the primary uh, tracers used for PET imaging today. So this is very exciting because we're now also able to make experimental tracers like f -Miso for imaging hypoxia in tumors. So very important for predicting tumor response. We also have a very strong basis of neuroimaging research going on with our functional and molecular imaging folks as well. These images are showing us images of tractography within the brain, these little spaghetti-like fronds uh, here, as you can see, uh, through the corpus callosum of the brain, demonstrating communication channels like little electrical wires, obviously, to connect and to transmit electrical circuitry and, and stimuli uh, through the brain. These are obtained during various neurostimulatory examinations with uh, flashing lights or auditory stimulations. And these help us to understand the brain pathways and what can happen when surgery occurs and some of these may be resected. So neuroimaging, of course, a highlight of our program. Part of the MRI physics group is obviously extraordinarily interested in protocol development. That is, how do we scan a patient? How do we look at the images of the brain and extract the relevant information needed to address clinical problems? So our MR physicists are a very big part of our research as well. And MRI research doesn't happen without sophisticated hardware. And this is an example of a recently installed seven Tesla MRI scanner, which we brought into the hospital recently for both research and clinical, allowing us to de demonstrate very small structures like cortical multiple sclerosis plaques, small little epileptic foci. Uh, because of the seven Tesla, we have increased the signal to noise um, more than double, obviously over a three Tesla MRI. MRI scanner. And so with this hardware and all of these devices, we're able to offer an exciting research opportunity for you and your future should you uh, come to the Brigham and Women's Radiology Department for your residency training. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, please don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Tempe. My name is Li Wei Jiang and I am working with Dr. Paul Shin on a few projects related to PET-CT guided interventions. So PET-CT, as you may know, combines anatomic and functional information. And as a guidance modality, it is very helpful in confirming placement of needles and ablation probes. So in this case, uh, we have ablation probes placed into metabolically active mesothelioma, and we can distinguish that uh, from uh, just scar tissue. So Dr. Shin likes to say that PET-CT is the lighthouse in the fog. So for one project, we are seeing if we can use IGT Fusion, which is a powerful uh, FDA-approved image fusion platform, to give fused images almost instantaneously when we step on the CT fluoroscopy pedal. So for another project, we're measuring the staph radiation dose, which is important to know because the while the scattered radiation from CT is almost entirely blocked by the protective apron, the high energy photons from the FDG PET will go right through the apron. So this FDG dose uh, is not well characterized and although it should be fairly small, it's still important to know what it is. So all in all, I've had an amazing time here in the CSRP. Thank you. Hi, I'm Kathy Andriol from the MGH and BWH Center for Clinical Data Science, and I'm here to describe what we call the data science pathway for Brigham residents in their fourth year. I want to describe a little bit about the center, which was formed through our radiology chairs at Brigham and at MGH. And we got involved in looking at using artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning in healthcare, and feel that we can be successful in this space, even though we have large entities such as Google, IBM, and so on, as well as small startups in this space. We thought that uh, 
three pieces that you need to be successful in this area are the clinical acumen, which we have in spades. We want to know what the use cases are and do things that are clinically relevant. You need to have access to data, which we have across both of our, our, our institutions, our Mass General Brigham wide, and the ability to translate these into the clinical arena, which is something we're very, very focused on at the center and ultimately wanting to see the models that we develop get into clinical use and assess them. And so we have a multidisciplinary environment that residents can immerse themselves in and learn about data science in medical imaging in particular. And so we have have the data science pathway which is now in its third year um, and we've had wonderful residents and our resident this year is Jisoo Kim and she'll describe the pathway for you but I want to also mention that even if you don't do the pathway we have instituted the noon conference uh, machine learning and informatics lecture series so all residents will get uh, some content and some education in these areas including some hands-on activities so now I want to uh, turn it over to our, our great resident Jisoo to describe the, uh, the pathway for you. Hi applicants, uh, welcome to Brigham. I'm Jisoo Kim, one of the current fourth years who is lucky to be part of the CCDS data science pathway. Um, so this pathway was first started two years ago uh, by our wonderful Dr. Kathy Andrew and Walter Wiggins, Travis Canton, both in the class of 2019. And the pathway consists of spending three to six months at CCDS, but this is flexible as you will be able to shape your fourth year pretty much however you wish. Um, and you will have your main research project um, and a team will be formed based on that, which consists of uh, clinical innovation fellows, data scientists, software engineers, and other radiologists. And while you work on your project, there will be longitudinal education courses, which include weekly journal clubs, conferences, and hands-on didactics, and you will learn a ton. And you don't have to be an expert in machine learning as this pathway will guide you through the exciting world of AI. <laughs> um, and mentoring will be provided by um, Kathy. Uh, there are a ton of opportunities through this pathway and I hope you can be a part of, the, uh, part of this during this exciting time. Um, all right, and some of our past projects include stroke art identification, as you can see in the upper left, uh, both ischemic and hemorrhagic. And this is uh, actually in the process of being implemented for clinical use on Visage, which is our PAC system. And um, other interesting project, um, we have the automatic segmentation of the lumbar spine and measurement of spinal canal, as well as neuroforaminal stenosis level by level, as this can be quite tedious. Um, if you join us in radiology, you will realize. And also uh, intra-abdominal fat measurement to assess abdominal obesity, as it is well studied that visceral fat contributes to a lot of uh, health risks. And, and this data is uh, actually in the research database called the Biobank, uh, which also includes genomic data. And this will be able to be used for uh, population health research. And Last but not least, my current project on the bottom right corner, uh, you can see the uh, glioblastoma multiforme in the left uh, frontal temporal lobe, and, which is outlined by the annotation there. And my project is to automatically segment these tumors on both um, on MRI on both multiple sequences uh, to assess longitudinal change first and also second treatment response, since small changes can be very hard to detect with our native eyes. And these cancers are very aggressive and the mean survival is usually less than two years. And if we can detect, the earlier we can detect the small change, um, the better. And it can have uh, tremendous implications on treatment planning because we can uh, modify the treatment based on how the tumor responses. And I'm currently actively working with Kathy, uh, another radiologist, my radiology attending, uh, data scientist, and an imaging physicist to um, go through the annotation data we have. And we're um, currently building the segmentation model with the help with our data science team. All right. Um, so AI is pretty cool. And as radiologists, we have the unique privilege um, 
to be able to interpret images like no others. And we should be a part of this uh, exciting innovation. And I hope this gives you an idea of what you will be able to do at Brigham. And have a great interview day. Great, thank you, Jisoo. And we look forward to answering your questions um, on, on your interview day. So thanks a lot. Welcome to the Brigham. Uh, I will focus on the Center for Evidence-Based Imaging, or CIBI. Uh, it is a translational research center of excellence, uh, which enables multidisciplinary and multi-center collaboration. Its mission is to bring measurable improvements in quality and safety to the care of our patients by reducing unwarranted variation in care delivery using innovative health IT tools and change management strategies. The work is funded through much philanthropy and federal and private foundation grants. The premise of the work is that improving healthcare does not require more discovery. Rather, it requires ensuring existing knowledge reaches patients, and it does so consistently. When we have uh, challenges that we would like to address with existing knowledge, we have to answer several important questions. Where do we find this knowledge? What's the evidence underlying this knowledge? How good is the evidence? And is it up to date? When we talk about consistently, the major challenge is to minimize unwarranted variation, which uh, requires changing both provider and patient behavior. So I'm going to provide uh, one example uh, for each of these. The first uh, one is Harvard Medical School's Library of Evidence is the work that CB is doing collaboratively with the Conway Library at uh, the school, at the medical school. And the goal here is to provide a public repository of evidence that can be used by computer systems to help physicians make better decisions. Um, the goal, the work involves harvesting evidence, whether in the form of literature that is published in the public domain, or guidelines that are published to take them apart and create machine readable forms of the evidence and grade it transparently so the user knows how good the evidence underlying each of these recommendations are and then to continuously update and make available at the library for everyone across the globe to use. The second example in reducing unwarranted variation uh, relates to how we convey diagnostic uncertainty in radiology reports. Radiologists use a lot of different terms. You see that on the uh, x-axis, various terms. And um, you can see that when we ask radiologists in a survey to say what they mean when they use a particular word and how sure they are about what they're trying to uh, communicate, there is a lot of variability. So let's Use an example. One radiologist in a report says suspicious for, it could mean anything from, it means very high likelihood of disease to very low likelihood of disease, depending on who the radiologist is, who is actually generating the report. And these styles, this how radiologists use these terms are not so trans, uh, or is not so transparent to our referring physicians and patients and can create confusion and lead to unnecessary diagnostic testing or potentially unnecessary therapeutic interventions. So we have developed a uh, certainty scale at the Brigham. We can do a Google search on BWH certainty scales and asking our radiologist to use particular terms only, these five terms, and it relates to how sure radiologists are when they're using these terms. And when radiologists use uncertain terms in the reports, we're asking them to insert the scale at the bottom of the reports so the meaning of the interpretation become more transparent and less ambiguous to both our patients and our referring physicians. And we're currently in the middle of this implementation and assessing its impact on our care processes. The training programs for residents that are offered through CB include a two-year evidence-based imaging uh, training program in conjunction with the Harvard School of Public Health. 
This is a two-year program in the fourth year of your residency plus a fifth year, uh, and it includes a seven-week program in clinical effectiveness that typically runs from July to August with the $20,000 tuition provided by CB. And the course load during these seven weeks accounts for about a third of the credit requirements for MPH for an MPH degree if a resident decided to pursue it after completing this uh, training program. In these two years, there is an 11th month clinical um, commitment at the resident's choice in which subspecialty they would like to pursue an 11th month of research in the other year. The second program to highlight is a Clinical Quality Improvement Leadership Training Program, or CKIP program, which we launched this year. It's a certificate program with lectures and an experiential component where a coach oversees the work of two learners. Uh, it's a three-month uh, training program in quality improvement that requires about two to four hours of work a week. We also offer mentoring and project-specific coaching to help our residents with relevant projects while they are here with us. Um, I hope this was informative. I wish you the best and best wishes for a successful uh, season and um, figuring out where you're going to spend uh, the next stage of your training. Thank you. Hello and welcome to the introduction to global health and radiology. I'm Dr. Stacy Smith, the Chief of Musculoskeletal Imaging and Intervention, and I have been involved in global health here at the Brigham for the past 10 years. I want to do a big shout out to Nanda Shah, who is a former graduate of our program, as well as the Global Health Radiology Program, who has graduated but presented this with me last year. As you can see on the map, we've kind of been across the globe starting in Bangladesh 10 years ago. We collaborated with the Navajo Nation, Shiprock, New Mexico, about eight years ago and have been continuing in that program ever since. This is a collaboration with the Brigham and Women's Indian Health Services Physicians Volunteer Program and entails both on-site visits at the hospital as well as teleradiology and consultation services. In 2013, we expanded to form a RAD-A chapter and our residents and fellows and faculty went to Haiti for an on-site visit working at the Bernard Mav Trauma Center, providing clinical services, as well as after returning back to Boston, teleradiology, as well as educational services. We also have a partnership with Partners in Health at Mirabelay Hospital in Haiti, we will talk about later. One of the largest programs that we started with the Human Resources for Health program was that of the residency program in Rwanda. This is the first residency program in Rwanda in the city of Kigali. And we have already had uh, the gr first graduates of that program. We are excited to have been able to provide full-time radiologists on the ground at Kigali Hospital, working with the Rwandan radiologists and residents and providing teleradiology consultation and educational services each year. We are still in, heavily engaged in both the Haiti and Rwanda programs in both teleradiology and on-site programs. And we will talk a little bit more about that as we move forward. We have a dedicated global health curriculum for our residents. This entails volunteer sessions every year of your training. And this is typically a teleradiology volunteer session to read CT images from Haiti that are sent to many institutions around the world. And we were one of the first online to help with those particular reads. We have a process where the residents can develop an education tool and provide interesting case conferences from these teleradiology sessions. And in your third year, you can apply for the global health track. And once you're accepted into that track, you have a certain specific curriculum. You will have those 10 volunteer sessions. You'll be responsible for a quality assurance project and a publication. You usually have formal coursework. Some have chosen a disaster uh, health program or other. An ultrasound elective in your fourth year has proven very useful in underserved areas. And finally, a global on-site project. 
The Brigham Haiti Teleradiology collaboration entails twice monthly volunteer opportunities available to residents. This is led by our ED radiologist, Dr. Sandra Duran Mendicetti, and many of us volunteers faculty to oversee and do teaching on these cases. We also read x-rays and ultrasounds and CTs for partners in Health Hospital in Mirabile, Haiti, where we can see multitude of different types of pathologies or infectious diseases and other kinds of presentations because they appear much later in the societies than we would see in our urban American settings. We note that there are many challenges. We see donated equipment at many of these sites or equipment malfunctions or lack of consistent IT support. And we can provide at least some assistance and perhaps some sustainability as we move forward in our collaborations. This is an image from the Haiti Global Health Trip that was conducted by Dr. Oren Johnson, a former resident and the first uh, senior resident who put together the global health program and he was supervised by glenn gaviola in march 2017. this comprised a two-week trip to the hospital universitaire de mirabele where they taught basic radiology interpretation to the internal medicine and emergency residents as you can see here as well as clinical consultations this group received a centers of expertise travel grant to make this possible the other program that's ongoing is a breast radiology in Rwanda program that was started by Dr. Sugar Raza, a Brigham and Women's radiologist in the breast imaging in 2012. This is an ultrasound and ultrasound guided biopsy teaching course that's given to doctors and nurses at the Bataro Cancer Center of Excellence, which is a partners in health facility in Bataro, Rwanda. This has significantly reduced surgical excisional biopsies for benign pathology and really emphasized the train the trainer program. They have on-site pathology and surgery, which allows for comprehensive management, and they have biannual trips for re-education and outcomes training. We have several funding services that we have used, the most recent of which is the Brigham Radiology IRAD seed grant. So come join us. We think you'll find yourself engaged and able to find your niche, and we look forward to meeting you. Hi everyone, I'm Shauna Madelon and I'm one of the Associate Program Directors of the Diagnostic Radiology Residency. I also happen to be a relatively recent graduate of the program. I'm going to spend the next several minutes to tell you a little bit about the Clinician Educator Track, which I was actually lucky enough to create and pilot during my fourth year as a resident. Um, this is actually a great example of how this residency will support you to follow your passions. If something doesn't exist when you get here, you know, we want to support you and your ideas once you get here to accomplish your goals. Um, so over the next couple minutes, I'll share with you a little bit about the pathway and give you some examples of what I accomplished during my fourth year, as well as one of our recent graduates, Matt Haber, who um, completed this pathway last year as well. So I wanna put in a quick plug just to share that there are tons of medical education opportunities, both inside and outside of the pathway. So if you're interested in medical education, but you don't wanna dedicate a significant portion of your fourth year to it, there's still a lot of ways that you can get involved in um, learning about education and also directly teaching. Um, so one cool thing is that Harvard Medical School has a mandatory radiology clerkship. And so we constantly have medical students rotating through our department. You can act as a mentor for them. You can also teach them during their clerkship um, as well. And then another cool thing is that Harvard Medical School has both a first and a second year anatomy lab and radiology has been integrated into those anatomy labs. And so we're always looking for volunteers to teach um, in the anatomy lab, which is a great opportunity to show medical students um, how cool radiology is. Um, finally, we have a lot of um, resident as teacher conferences as part of our beyond interpretations curriculum. Um, and we do a lot of peer teaching with the residents teaching each other rad path topics and then also senior teaching conferences. But um, if you're particularly interested in medical education, we also have a clinician educator pathway, which is geared towards people who um, want to develop a niche or develop a reputation as an educator. Um, it's very flexible, but we do have some sort of baseline curriculum that you can follow on learning theory. You can do hands-on teaching, curriculum design, uh, evaluation and feedback, mentorship, and then educational leadership and research and scholarship. And we have uh, dedicated mentoring in the form of me, um, although there are a lot of other people in the department who are interested in medical education. And if you happen to jive with them better, you're welcome to work with them as well. Um, and then we have departmental support and funding um, for various things, including the Harvard Macy uh, Clinician Educator course, which I'm gonna talk about next. 
Um, so this is a couple of pictures from the Harvard Macy Institute. I took this course when I was a fourth year resident and I actually go back now each year as a faculty member. And this is a picture of me and Matt Haber, who was the resident uh, recent grad that I spoke about who took this course last year. So I was both there as a faculty member and also serving as his mentor for the project that he applied to uh, the program with. So this is a three day course. It's very intense, a lot of um, learning about learning learning about teaching, and you also get to work on a um, sort of scholarship project while you're there as well. We're also really lucky to have interfaced with the Brigham Education Institute, which is a hospital-wide entity. It provides medical education mentorship matching opportunities, weekly programming, including journal clubs and different lectures on medical education topics, and they also have funding opportunities. So this is a great place um, to sort of secure a little grant for a medical education project, which one of our residents actually has done. Um, during this year, Matt and I both spent a lot of time doing medical education research and scholarship. So this is a picture from Matt Haber's uh, scholarly project where he was evaluating resident perceptions of the learning environment and personal well-being using a team-based approach to case conferences, which you can see the residents sitting together in groups pre-COVID, of course, um, as compared to the traditional hot seat style of case conference. And we're currently in the process of editing the manuscript, which will be submitted soon. Um, I also had the opportunity to be very productive during my fourth year. This is um, from PubMed. There was four papers that I was able to first author during my fourth year um, elective time. So a lot of opportunity to be um, to work on your scholarship and work on your writing skills. Um, Matt Haber also participated in um, sort of a combination of a med ed quality improvement and well wellness project. Um, so our residency is very forward thinking when it comes to quality improvement and during Matt's time as a resident, he received abundant support and guidance as one of our founders of our uh, residency wellness committee and he led the planning and implementation of our first annual radiology residency retreat in 2018 and we've had one every year since. Um, he also was able to write this up, so he got some street cred for it. And this is an example of um, one of the articles that came out about the paper that he wrote. Um, during this year, we also encourage you to get involved in um, different national committees and leadership. So um, Matt and I both participated in the radiographics um, committee for the resident and fellows section. So we evaluate the educational posters um, from the RSNA meetings and decide which ones are going to be published um, officially. And then I was also lucky enough to be selected as the Valerie P. Jackson Education Fellowship from the ACR. And I got to spend a week in Reston, Virginia at the ACR headquarters. Um, you can also do a lot of curriculum design during this time. Um, so one of the things that I started teaching and still teach is the introduction to radiology for the general surgery medical students. And Matt Haber created a fundamentals of neuroradiology tutorial that our medical students still use to this day. Um, so these are just some examples of some of the things that you could do if you were to come here and partake in this track. Um, I hope that this was helpful and we're here to support you. So if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to either of us. Thanks for your consideration. Hello, everyone. My name is Stephen Seltzer, and I'm the Brigham and Women's Radiology Department Chair Emeritus. And along with my colleague, Junzi Shi, we'd like to talk with you about a unique component of our residency curriculum, namely training in healthcare business, administration, leadership, and management a uh, module that we added last year and it has both a basic and an advanced option and we'd like to describe it for to you briefly and uh junzi do you want to give us some more background great hi everyone my name is junzi Shi. i'm currently an msk fellow at brigham and last year i was chief resident i'm thrilled to be here today to talk to you about the leadership track that I had put together with the help and support of my mentor, Dr. Seltzer. So the purpose of um, this curriculum, it's an innovative curriculum that teaches clinicians critical skills in the business of radiology, hospital operations, strategic design, negotiations, leadership, and management skills. Um, just like Dr. Seltzer said, we have two components. And first, we'll talk about the basic curriculum for all trainees. Thank you, Junzi. The uh, uh, every radiology resident uh, needs to uh, be trained uh, in uh, 
set of skills that the American Board of Radiology calls non-interpretive skills. It's important skills that every physician should know. And there are some <laughs> things that are generic, uh, like professionalism and ethics and, there's, and leadership. And there are some that are specific to radiology, uh, one of which is a component of this curriculum called the business of radiology. And the ABR has put together a syllabus. You can see a little icon for that in the lower left corner. And we have an excerpt uh, from the table of contents uh, that uh, are really the headlines of the basic curriculum that everyone uh, uh, will have. Uh, we'll be uh, presenting the basic curriculum uh, during the course of each year, uh, either as a didactic uh, or case study situation uh, baked into the uh, teaching conference schedule and uh, we have a list of topics that we'll be covering. It's an eight-part curriculum, uh, five case-based sessions, and then three more personal stories. And so uh, we will uh, try to uh, use formats uh, uh, not strictly didactic, uh, but to make this as interesting and worthwhile for everyone as possible. Uh, these are some of the potential topics that we'll be uh, covering, which I think you'll agree are all uh, interesting, although some sometimes a little abstruse, but uh, something that every physician needs to know and every radiologist needs to know. We also have an elective uh, for senior residents, um, the so-called advanced curriculum, and Junzi is uh, completing that, and uh, she'll tell you what that includes. Great, thank you. So for during my fourth year, I put together a leadership and business management track that contained all the elements I was interested in learning. Because our standard radiology residency curriculum doesn't always include these um, aspects about business, I put together certain elements including didactic work, mentorship, scholarship, and, and shadowing to help supplement um, those aspects that I wanted to learn. So for example, um, this included didactics um, that would involve participating in the RLI curriculum. So the RLI is the Radiology Leadership Institute under the heading of American College of Radiology. Within the RLI, there are multiple modules that are offered, including the two that I participated in, um, Maximize Your Influence and Impact and Leadership Essentials. Both of these modules were um, kind of regular uh, monthly didactics, which involved live recorded lectures and live discussion with the presenters. And Dr. Boland, our um, chair at the time, had been participating as one of the um, presenters as well. So it was very um, it seemed close to home and it was very relevant to what we were, were going through. The practical component involves participating in the RLI Leadership Summit, which is typically in September of every year. I really enjoyed the summit itself because it, it brought together leaders from both private practice and academic worlds. And it um, help to ned both the leaders who are very experienced in these areas with young professionals, residents and fellows who were up and coming young leaders and had, had very interesting workshops that involved um, everyone. In addition, the practical component involved shadowing leaders at both um, the Mass General PO, the BWPO and the partners or MGB levels so that I could see um, and get some exposure to decision-making at, at each of these different levels. The scholarship component for me um, also merged with the time when we had our first COVID outbreak. So a lot of the scholarship components um, involved um, putting together the work that I had performed as chief resident, doing quantitative analyses of um, of those outcomes and that resulted in several papers. So for example, one of them was about radiology workload changes during the pandemic with implications for staff redeployment. And this was published in Academic Radiology just recently. 
Um, another paper described what our residency education team had done as, um, as a response to the COVID pandemic initially. And this was a descriptive editorial paper. And then we also, um, I came up with this, this way to interpret changes and disruption to educational, um, you know, educational curriculum during the pandemic by measuring block weeks based on the schedule. And so I wrote a paper, or we wrote a paper together um, quanti quantifying those changes in, in this article. So overall, um, you know, we're very lucky to be part of this program. And I think that the leadership and, and business track can be molded to whatever your interests are. Um, and Dr. Seltzer, turning it over to you. Thanks, Jensen, for uh, describing uh, your in-depth program. And uh, as mentioned, there's a basic curriculum for everyone. So uh, I hope we've given you a good flavor of uh, this unique uh, module in our education program. Thank you for listening.